All righty, I think we'll get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jessica Katz. I am a board member of the Holocaust Memorial Miami Beach. Uh, thank you for joining us today in commemoration of International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Uh, I'm honored to introduce today's program at a truly critical time for Holocaust education. Uh, I am the proud granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. Uh, though my grandparents didn't speak very often about those years, it was clear that their experience weighed heavily on them. Um, I was so lucky to know them, to live alongside them for many years. Um, and it's so crucial to teach about the Holocaust and to learn from its lessons and to never forget. 15 years ago, the United Nations designated January 27th uh, which was the day in 1945 when Auschwitz was liberated as the International Day of Commemoration in memory of the victims of the Holocaust. The Holocaust Memorial Miami Beach shares with you and with millions around the world this day of remembrance and commemoration. Many of you have seen the film Who Will Write Our History. As part of this day of remembrance, it is still available for you to stream after this presentation with film director Roberta Grossman and our very own Dr. Miriam klein Kasanoff. Roberta Grossman is the writer, producer, and director of four documentaries about Jewish history and culture, including the topic of today's film, Who Will Write Our History, as well as a three-time recipient of the National Endowment for the Arts grants. The discussion will be moderated by the Holocaust Memorial's Education Committee Chair, Dr. Miriam klein Kasanoff. Miriam is also the director of the University of Miami Holocaust Teacher Institute and our district Holocaust curriculum supervisor for Miami-Dade County Public Schools. Please join me in welcoming them both. And now I will turn it over to you, Dr. Miriam klein Kasanoff. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. And welcome, welcome, welcome to all of you. How wonderful that you're all here today participating in this program. We have well over 200 people on board and thank you Sharon Horowitz, the executive director of the Memorial and Danny Reed. And most of all, I want to thank Roberta Grossman and welcome you today to have this wonderful conversation that we're going to have on the film uh, who will write our history that I hope most of our audience has seen. And if they haven't, they will be available to them. Roberta, welcome, welcome to Miami. It's a pleasure and an honor to speak to you and to spend this time with you. I don't know if you remember me, but I did meet you out by the popcorn machine when the film premiered here at the Miami Jewish Film Festival. And I was so impressed with you, uh, not necessarily so much then as the professional that you are, but the person that you are, because you were so accessible. I walked right up to you and I said, hi, you're the producer. I'm so happy to meet you. And we got into this wonderful conversation. So um, let's begin with a dialogue. In our audience, we have people who know about the Holocaust, people who don't know about the Holocaust. We have teachers from the Miami-Dade County Schools. We have survivors. We have students. This particular piece of history is such a fascinating piece of history, and yet so few know about it, if not for your film. Tell us how you first heard about the Oinik Shabbat group and what about it inspired you so much that you felt you just had to make a film about it? Hi, thank you. Thank you for your question. And thank you for reminding me of us meeting at the popcorn uh, stand, always a good place to meet. Um, I was working on another film, a documentary that was set in the interwar period uh, in, in Warsaw, which is a very rich, vibrant um, moment in Jewish civilization. Um, and Polish civilization. Um, and I read a review of Sam Kassow's book, Who Will Write Our History? Uh, and then I went and got the book 
and I started reading it and I was just a few pages in when I was just struck, like, you know, struck by lightning that I, I spent my entire life um, reading and learning about the Holocaust, making some films about it. Uh, and I had never heard of uh, Emanuel Ringelblum or the Onyx Shabbos archive. And to me, and the more I learned about it, um, especially as I began my, my eight year conversation with Sam Cassa, the author of the book, uh, to me, it became um, a travesty uh, of enormous proportions that had to be uh, rectified. Uh, and to me, the best way to teach history is through film. I, obviously, I have a vested interest in that belief, um, but I really do believe that. Uh, and I wanted millions of people around the world to know about Ringo Bloom and the other members of the Onyx Shabbos Archive, what they did, what they experienced, and what they accomplished. Thank you. Um, you know, I think that it's always important when we uh, do anything with Holocaust education that we give historical context. And one of the things that we try to stress is to always talk about the vibrant cultural life of the Jewish people before the Nazis came in and took that culture away. So tell us a little bit about what was life like in Warsaw, before the Warsaw, Poland, before the Nazis um, occupied, and then what they did to uh, put all the Jews into the Warsaw ghetto, where the Onik Shabbat group actually did their work. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, that, those are two very, very huge yeah, questions. <laughs> Um, uh, the new Pauline Museum uh, in Warsaw, which is the history of uh, Polish Jewish life in, uh, you know, in that area of Jewish life in Poland, it, it traces a thousand years of Polish Jewish history. So uh, I can just tell you that as I say in the film, as we say in the film, in Warsaw between the war, there were hundreds of Jewish uh, day schools from far left Zionist schools to religious rights schools. Uh, there were hundreds, thousands of organizations, each uh, advocating for what they believe was the best answer to the Jewish problem, which uh, in, in different, seen in, from a different perspective than how the Nazis saw it, which is basically, do we stay in Europe? Do we go to Palestine? Do we build a Jewish state? Do we contribute to the, revol the proletariat revolution? Do we retreat into ourselves? Uh, culturally with Yiddish or retreating to ourselves religiously and culturally with, uh, you know, with the Jewish, you know, obviously the Jewish religion or some combination thereof. And there were parties that, political parties, you know, it, you know, we think we're, we live in a polarized time that it's very difficult to have a, a, a family meal or Thanksgiving meal with Uncle Joe who, you know, voted for you know who and so and so. Anyway, but it, you know, it's uh, it was pretty polarized then as well. And uh, the political party you belonged to also meant who your friends were, what you read, what language you spoke, who you married. It was a very intense culture: arts, culture, uh, business, history, um, language, literature, music, you name it. Um, and in terms of what the Nazis did to move the Jews into the ghetto, they started building the ghetto as soon as they, pretty soon after they uh, uh, occupied Poland in September 1939, but the ghetto wasn't closed. It was like a, you know, boiling a frog kind of thing. If you start the temperature low, it's uh, less likely that the frog will jump out. They, they started building uh, the ghetto walls. Uh, actually, Jewish uh, builders were building it and the Jewish community have to, had to pay for it. Um, but it wasn't until November 1940, a year, a year almost in two months after the uh, occupation of Warsaw or the invasion of Poland. And then over time, they kept on changing the boundaries of the ghetto, making it smaller. So uh, it was a process, not an event. Emanuel Ringelblum, the Yiddish scholar, who was uh, incarcerated in the ghetto, came up with this idea, being that he was a historian before he went into the ghetto, that if they couldn't fight physically with ammunition, they could at least fight back with what we call spiritual resistance. And he got the idea of putting together this group of people, which he called the 
Unik Shabbat or Oinik, depending on the dialect of which part. My father always said Oinik. I think it depends on, you know, which part of Europe you came from. Uh, to put together this cultural group to um, document their experiences. Could you tell us a little bit more about the group, about Emmanuel, and why did, it, and why did he call it Oneg Shabbat? Um, well, I'll start with why they called it Oneg Shabbat. Oneg Shabbat is in, uh, uh, in Hebrew and Oneg Shabbat is in Yiddish. Um, uh, so he would have said Oinig Shabbos, and I'm probably not even saying that right. Uh, uh, everyone in the group primarily, mostly was multilingual. They went easily back and forth between Polish and Yiddish, in some cases Hebrew, French, German, other languages. Um, but speaking Yiddish was a political and, and cultural choice. Um, Ringo Bloom was, uh, was a historian in the uh, tradition, the emerging tradition of Simon Dubno, which is the, the idea that uh, Sam Casso taught me that you can't really have a people without a history and you can't have a history without an archive. And Emmanuel Ringo Bloom was very, very involved in YIVO, um, which formed in the 20s in Vilna. Uh, and basically the Onik Shabbos was uh, YIVO in the Warsaw Ghetto. And the idea was, uh, I don't think it started out so much as resistance, of course, though it was empirically resistance. It started out literally as a way to uh, collect and record the ex eyewitness experiences of a wide range of people in the ghetto, a wide range of Jewish people in the ghetto uh, and outside of the ghetto, so that when the, when the war was over, Jewish historians, including Ringo Bloom and others, could write the history of the war from Jewish documents and from Jewish first-person uh, testimony. Uh, and then as time went on and they realized, well, hey, wait, it's quite likely that not many of us will, will, can, will survive, uh, or actually uh, it's likely that maybe none of us will survive. And they realized what they were doing is they were creating a time capsule to speak to the future and that it was unlikely that any of them would survive to write the story. But who, whether they wrote the story or others wrote the story on their behalf, they wanted the story to be told, the story of the Jewish experiences of World War II and of the Warsaw Ghetto in particular, Polish Jews in particular, to be told from the point of view of the Jews themselves and a wide range of the Jews themselves because they were not monolithic, they were very diverse. Um, and, you know, it's like when you, uh, when somebody stands up and speaks at, at my funeral, I hope it will be somebody who kind of likes me, not somebody who loathes me enough to uh, completely try to wipe me off the face of the earth and everyone I know and everything I stand for. Um, so they didn't want the Germans, God forbid, if they should win the war, they didn't want them to write the history of the Jewish people. So that was the impulse. And yes, it did, it did turn into resistance because not only were they speaking to the future and doing something illegal, the Onik Shabbos was illegal, they were all risking their lives by participating in it, but they also managed to collect very good information, not only from uh, Warsaw, but, um, uh, but from out, throughout Poland and ultimately, uh, well, mostly Poland, and they were able to smuggle that information, very, very carefully collected um, empirical information, and smuggle it out to the Polish government in exile uh, in London. And those were some of the first information about the, the genocide, uh, the Holocaust that was unfolding. So they had hoped that once the world knew, of course, that something would happen, and it was crushing that it didn't, but that was their hope and their belief, and certainly was a, a realistic hope. Thank you. That's very comprehensive answer. So now let's turn to the narrator, Rachel. She's quite an interesting character. And I'm so glad that you highlighted her and that she's really the focus uh, here. Um, what should we know more about her uh, to remind our uh, participants? Uh, Rachel is the woman that Emmanuel um, uh, brought into the group and felt that she would be the perfect person to be a leader of the Onik Shabbat group. So what should we know more about her and her specific cause and reason that she agreed to help? And also uh, she started it by doing the soup kitchen or she was in the soup kitchen before she came in. Could you tell us a little bit more about Rachel and her goals sure. and her role sure. in all of this? Sure. Well, Rachel Auerbach was a, a Jewish intellectual who, like Ringo Bloom, came to Warsaw in the late 20s, early 30s. Um, and she was a writer. She wrote book reviews, poetry reviews, uh, 
uh, theater reviews, film reviews. Um, she was a journalist. Um, and uh, she knew Ringo Bloom from before the war. They were both involved in Evo, uh, Ringo Bloom more so than she. Uh, and she came to see him before, uh, at his request, the day before she was leaving to join her family in another part of, uh, of Poland. And he told her, you know, I want you to stay uh, because Ringo Bloom at that time was was running the Jewish self-help funded by the Joint Distribution Committee. And he asked her to stay and run a soup kitchen. And basically he said to her, we can't all run away. Ringo Bloom was a very ethical person and Auerbach was too. And although she wanted to leave, she didn't. Um, and so she was uh, running the soup kitchen and she was not writing for the Onik Shabbos at the beginning. He was encouraging her to do so, but she was having a hard time writing. Ultimately, she did start writing and she did start uh, depositing her writing uh, into the archive. And uh, just, uh, you know, the, the archive was run by men, but Ringo Bloom did include many women in the sort of the second tier of the organization. And he, he very much wanted the voices of women to be uh, included in the archive. And that leads me to the next question I was going to ask you to me, and I'm ho hoping to the viewers. Um, the role of women seems to be emphasized a great deal um, uh, through the use of uh, Rachel. Please speak to that. You know, I often feel that um, um, Ringelblum was an early feminist. <laughs> in that he had this strong uh, propensity to know the strength that women could bring to uh, resistance and to the group. Well, I don't know if, if Ringo Bloom was an early feminist. I mean, I wouldn't disagree with that, but Ringo Bloom was, um, he was, a, 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 he was a, a leftist and he believed in sort of a little d democracy and if there was a story to be told, let's say of a ball bouncing in a courtyard, he wanted the story told from the point of view of the ball, the point of view of the child holding the, bo the ball, bouncing the ball, the point of view of the mother watching the child playing and so on and so forth. To have women involved in, in writing for the archive. There were women who uh, did interviewing for the archive. They didn't always know they were working for the archive. There was one woman who was very involved in writing for the archive and Ringo Bloom tasked her with uh, interviewing women about the role of women in the ghetto. And she actually went to interview Rachel Auerbach and neither of them knew that they were both working for the archive because secrecy was up, utmost importance because the archive was an ultimate uh, treasure and they didn't want it to be found and destroyed by the, uh, by the Nazis. So uh, I, I think that Ringo Bloom was inclusive, uh, including inclusive of women. He was also inclusive. I, uh... Uh, of religious people, he was included of, inclusive of young people. He's, he he launched a competition for Jewish uh, youth to write essays about their experiences. He was inclusive of refugees, and on and on and on. That's what I was going to ask you next. That it seemed that uh, Ringelblum felt that there had to be a variety of documents that were to be written and saved. It wasn't just historical. Uh, there were articles from newspapers and all kinds of things. Could you just tell us a little bit about the variety of documents that they worked on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the archive has everything from poems, theater tickets, bus tickets, food, ration tickets, uh, <laughs> magazines, newspapers. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a very contemporary way of doing history, right? Um, first of all, it's history from the bottom up, which is what I've been trying mm -hmm. to get at, um, which was, uh, uh, again, it's all, it's from YIVO. YIVO had people sending in stuff from all over Eastern Europe. Uh, they had Zomlers, collectors everywhere, who both, uh, you know, physically went out from YIVO and Zomlers in small towns who sent stuff to YIVO. And they wanted everything. They wanted the poems, they wanted the lullabies, they wanted the recipes for chicken soup. And there was, it was the same thing in the, in the, with the Onik Shabbos and the ghetto. They wanted the, really the feeling of the, of the full life of the people, of the everyday person. Um, and uh, they didn't want history from the top down, you know, government, military, the rabbis, whatever, the higher ups, they wanted history from the, the bottom up. And that's perhaps why you have the emphasis on women as well. Yeah, yeah. When I first opened the conversation with you, I didn't tell you that uh, 
I was trained by the leaders of the Warsaw Ghetto Resistance, Sven and Vlad Gamid. And I had intensive training about the Warsaw Ghetto. I uh, went to Israel for a month and studied the Abasham and at Lachamea and the Ghetto, oh, the Ghetto Fighter says. But there was very little discussion about this particular Onik Shabbat group. And so I really want to emphasize to our audience, to our students, to our teachers, that this was a very important piece of what was going on in the ghetto. So August 12th is a big turning point in the story when the action or action order came to deport the Jews to the death camp Treblinka. Tell us about what the group then had to quickly do to decide to do with all the work that they had been doing. Well, they had to bury it, right? I mean, right. It was a, 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 you know, they were they were collecting um, in those previous two years, but when they realized that this this terrible action was happening, uh, they decided to bury what they had, um, and it was a good thing that they did. They also went around people who they knew were writing diaries and asked them to deposit their diaries in the archives. Some did, and some didn't. Um, and it's a good thing that they did because many, many, many members of the archive were deported and, and murdered. Um, uh, there was something about, I don't know, 450, I don't know at the, exactly that moment, 450, 500,000 Jews in the ghetto before the great deportation. Uh, and uh, when it was over, there was some 50,000. So it was a very uh, devastating event. And not long after is when the uprising happened. So, uh, the, you know, the first cache was buried. Uh, during the great deportation, the second cache was buried sometime thereafter, and the third cache was buried right before the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Um, one of the workers says in the movie, after burying the documents, I only wish to be remembered, remember my name. Uh, let's discuss for a moment how important that is for our survivors today, uh, this whole idea and that came from that also of just remember my name. Well, I mean, the person who said that was a 19 year old young man, right? Who was uh -huh. one of the few people who was helping their teacher uh, bury the archive during the deportation. Um, and I think that it's a pretty human, um, a pretty human uh, uh, a hope to be remembered, right? I mean, that's, all of us can understand that. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about the Onik Shabbos archive is that they, yes, they wanted the Jewish story writ large to be remembered, but they also wanted to be remembered as individuals. Um, and um, there was a great deal of emphasis on, uh, emphasis on uh, di diary writing in the ghetto. Mm -hmm. um, and that's obviously a very personal endeavor. Uh, but so I think it was a dual, it was a dual uh, goal, one to be remembered as individuals and the other to be remembered uh, as the Jewish people. I'm so glad you said that one statement that remembering one individual, because what we teach here a lot is um, Yad Vashem teaching that, that to make this relevant and so important to our students and teachers, the 6 million number is just too huge to comprehend. So always take out one body from that number and emphasize the story of that one person. So this really fits right into that very well. Um, I'm gonna now ask you a couple of logistical questions about the film. Uh, where did you find the actors for the film? And what was your criteria in choosing those, like Rachel, particularly actors? Well, I filmed the, 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 the dramatizations in the film in Poland. Uh -huh. For a variety of reasons, it's a Polish story. Um, Polish actors and Polish people look different than Americans, um, and um, I wanted that feeling of gravitas and authenticity. Uh, in terms of what I looked for in them, was great acting and connection to understanding of and commitment to telling the story. If I were to say to you. Um... You finished the film. What were the final unanswered questions that you had when you finished the film? Things that kept going around in your head and, and wondering about that you just did not 
get a chance to maybe research or go further into? Was there anything that you really felt you could have delved deeper or there were questions that still linger in your mind? That's a great question, but the answer is no. That wasn't what <laughs> offered, you know, because I worked on the film for eight years. It's not that there wasn't a lot more to learn. There was, I, that's not what I'm saying. I just, it's just that that wasn't what bothered me. What bothered me is the amount of writing, the number of people that it represented, the people's stories who were not included in the film. For example, uh, as you probably know, there are, I don't know, hundreds, some hundred, I don't know how many, but over a hundred poems in the archive in various languages, primarily in Yiddish. It's very hard to stop a film uh, to say, okay, now let's read a poem. So there, there's no poetry in, in the film. Um, there are amazing, amazing writers who are not mentioned and whose work is not quoted. Um, you know, so it's really not what I didn't know, but what I knew and couldn't put in that bothered me. So is there going to be like a sequel to this yet? Are you thinking that though? Uh, how did you personally feel emotionally throughout the making and particularly when you were finished with the, with the whole film? It, it's a very, you know, a touching, uh, emotionally impacted film. Um, you know, I've just been dealing with the Holocaust really deeply um, my whole life. Um, and I apparently developed some kind of coping mechanism um, mm -hmm. so that I'm not in a heap all the time. Um, I, I read Holocaust literature in my spare time. It's not something that I avoid and I, it's, I, uh, the pri my, par my primary feeling and emotion while making the film was the, a few, two, two things. One was that it was an enormous honor to tell the story and mm -hmm. two, that it was because it was so enormous and the story was so important, I was completely terrified the entire time that I wouldn't get it right, that I didn't know how to do it, that I didn't know enough, that I, you know, how to make a film, how to make the film engaging, what to put in, what to leave out, terrified the whole time. And um, uh, when I was done, I, I, I felt really uh, uh, something I, more than any other film I've ever made, and I don't know, at this point I made 40 or 50 hours of documentary films, I, you know, I, um, I felt really, really, really gratified and really, really proud and uh, satisfied. Um, I, I felt, uh, I, I hope this doesn't sound, I'm just speaking honestly, I felt really good about Blue Rider history. I felt that I had managed to reach some, some form for it that was reaching people. And uh, in particular, Sam Casso was happy, so that was great. Well, on behalf of being a child survivor of the Holocaust myself, on behalf of all the survivors, you should feel good about yourself. Okay. And I'm afraid I'm getting a little choked up in wanting to thank you to do these wonderful films that you have done on the Holocaust so that our teachers and students out there, if they don't like reading history books, um, that they can view a film like yours and then ask the question, how did this happen? Why did this happen? What did the Jews do to even deserve this? And I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Well, that's very that sweet of you. What is your, your audience, are they seeing the full length film or the short film, educational film? Um, the Holocaust Memorial has sponsored this program and I've been, I'm the education chair for the memorial and for the school district head of Holocaust. So they honored me by asking me to uh, interview you. My understanding from the flyer that went out was that the shortened version, the education version, has been sent out for over the past two weeks by the Holocaust Memorial. Okay. And teachers and students who are on today, I would assume, have seen the film. And that's why we started the discussion, assuming that they saw it. Right. But it's very well, likely that they can still see it. I believe the memorial is going to keep it going and post it for a while. That, you know, just teachers should know, um, if they don't already, uh, that there's a study guide for the film, uh, for the short film that's available through Facing History at Ourselves. Um, it's available. And I want you to know that Judy Bond, B-O-H-N, who's one of the staff of Facing History and Ourselves, is on today. Right. 
So uh, she can post in the chat the link for the study guide, and we are going to go to the questions and answers soon. So I'm just going to end this discussion besides my profound personal thanks as a child survivor. Um, I quote from the final scenes of the film, it seems the written word is the last witness. Mm. Where did you get that quote um, and explain how that is true? The written word and indeed, besides those of us survivors who have the oral word, but then the written word is indeed a very important witness. Yeah, the, the Barbara Christian Black Gimlet, the scholar who's uh, one of the scholars who's in the film says that without the Ring of Bloom archive, we wouldn't know anything about the Warsaw Ghetto. We just know what the Germans wanted us to know. We wouldn't know how people lived, how they died, how they cared for one another, how they cared for themselves, how they fought, how they cooperated, how they fed one another. I mean, you just wouldn't know anything, and especially you wouldn't know about all the self-help uh, and the cooperation, about the literary evenings, and also even among survivors, you know, if you had the misfortune to have been in the ghetto and then weirdly didn't go to Treblinka, where almost no one survived, but went to some other camp, let's just say, even though it's a historical for the most part, that you went to Auschwitz, you probably wouldn't remember the day that you saw, you know, a young kid singing a, a singing for bread in the ghetto, right? And what the, and what the, and what the song was and what the words were. Um, you'd remember something else. I mean, well, you, you'd be remembering how you survived, how you suffered in Auschwitz and how you were liberated and everything else. I mean, so the details, the eyewitness details would be lost to history if we didn't have the Onik Shabbos archive. And I forgot to mention one last thing that I think is extremely important. Please tell us the end of, uh, how these uh, documents are in the milk cans that are at the United States Holocaust Museum. Well, there's only, there's one uh, milk can at the United States Holocaust Museum and I believe it's empty. The documents themselves uh, and the other extant milk can are at the Jewish Historical uh, Institute in Warsaw, the Ringelblum Archive, where they've been since uh, the end of the war, since they came out of the ground in 46 and 50. They were found right after the war, one, underground. One cache, one cache was found in 46. Uh, a second cache was found in 50. Uh, and I believe the third one, well, the third one was never found, sorry. So now we're going to go to the questions from the audience. Uh, Danny, are you going to be reading the chat or would you like me to, or do you want Roberta to read our own questions? Um, hi, whatever you like. I do have, we're going to enable the chat again so people can ask questions. So if the chat can be enabled. Um, I do have some questions from, uh, from earlier, from earlier in the chat. Here, let me just, uh, that I can, uh, that I can ask. Do, why don't we start with that? And then okay. uh, we'll take a look at the uh, chat. So just one minute. One, uh, one question that, uh, that came up was, um, were any, was any of the archival material that was found, was it used in any of the uh, war crimes trials? Uh, I don't know for certain. Um, I mean, I know that Rachel Auerbach uh, did testify briefly at Nuremberg. Uh, and then, of course, I mean, the biggest war crime trial was the Eichmann trial. And uh, Rachel Auerbach was... She left, she left Poland along with First Foster and his wife, Bluma, who were the only members of the Onik Shabbos to survive out of the 60 or so members of the archive. Uh, and Rachel started the survivor testimony department at Yad Vashem. And during her tenure there, she, they recorded about 50,000 survivor testimonies. This was a continuation of Onik Shabbos, right? So um, when uh, the Eichmann trial uh, was in, uh, when Eichmann was captured and the trial was being prepared, it was Rachel Auerbach who convinced Gideon Hausner, the uh, lead prosecutor for Israel, to base the trial on survivor testimony on survivor te uh, witnesses, survivor witnesses in court. And a lot of it wasn't about Eichmann at all. It was the telling of the story of the Holocaust. And since Auerbach knew so many of the, of the people and so many of the survivors and so many of their testimony, she was able to help him shape it. So uh, I, 
there's a connection. She said, she, had, she spoke very briefly in the trial. She was very, very crushed by this. But she said when she was on the witness stand, she said that there was a direct line from the Onik Shabbos in the ghetto to the trial, to the witness stand where she was standing that day. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, another person was asking uh, about, in terms of the, your research into uh, Polish society prior to the war, like how integrated was, were parts of the Jewish community? And I guess, you know, the follow-up would be, well, how much of a shock was revealed in, in the archival material about what they were going through? once the, the Nazis... Well, that's, a, that's such a great question, but I, you know, I, it, it's a very complex question, and I don't think there's one answer, but on a very sort of, you know, uh, bird's eye view level, I would say that the Jews of Poland were a lot less shocked than the Jews of Hungary, right? Because they were not as assimilated, they had a, a more uh, intense uh, self, you know, culture, self-cultures, you know, Jewish cultures, uh, there were Jewish schools, as I mentioned before, there were Jewish, you know, like 100 Jewish newspapers or something like that. So there was a very vibrant, although not isolated or insular Jewish culture in Poland, it, there was a very vibrant Jewish culture. Um, and I think in places like Hungary and even in Germany, although there was some Jewish culture, they were much more assimilated. I mean, just as a very broad stroke. So I think the Jews of Poland were a lot less shocked. And uh, can you, can you, t you mentioned um, I can, um, I'm, uh, Auerbach, Rachel Auerbach, uh, as one of the cent central characters that you, you made her one of the central characters in the documentary. And you did briefly mention the role of, uh, of women. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about, about that, like what you discovered in terms of the role of women uh, in the ghetto, how it changed, did it change? And, you know, as in everywhere else, and often with immigrant uh, refugees, immigrants, you know, a lot of times, uh, at least historically, men have tended to fall apart, and um, women uh, maybe be out of necessity, you know, because they all of the pillars, you know, work, standing in the communities, you know, whatever self-esteem, those those are uh, those fall away more quickly for men. Whereas the sort of more traditional, at least of that time, role for women in the home, those things remained intact in the raising and caring and feeding of children and, and the rest. But also, um, you know, men were hauled away for labor. Um, and many of the, and the conditions in the labor battalions and in the labor camps were horrendous. And those who didn't die and came back were destroyed physically and, and uh, emotionally. So it, it, it fell to women often to to take leadership roles. And Ringo Blue says in his diary, he said that when the war is over, you know, because he was really struck by the role of women in organizing Jewish society in the ghetto and their strength and their fortitude. Um, and he said, when the war is over, you know, the, the Jewish women are gonna play a big role, a much bigger and more public role in Jewish life. He wasn't wrong. Oh, thank you. Um... There, the, you know, I probably was a student that asked uh, if any Jews actually fought um, and fought the Nazis. And we did mention at the very beginning, I think, or, or you know, the Oneg Shabbos, what they did was a form of resistance. So I guess I have, I'm interpreting this two parts. Can you talk a little bit more about what they did as an act of resistance and some of the dangers they faced? Oh, yeah, yeah. And oh, I'm sorry. if you have any information, about uh, did they take part in helping organize the um, the fighting uh, with the fighting groups or any connection with the fighting groups in the ghetto? So there was a organized Jewish military resistance in the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, it started in April of 1943. And uh, these basically kids with uh, Molotov cocktails and a few guns, uh, bad guns or an old guns, they held off this massive German army that had, um, you know, b basically swept through and, and, uh, and subjugated all of Europe and its armies. But I think they held out for about 50 days, if I'm not right, if I'm not mistaken. Um, there three, were tremendous- Three and a half, four weeks. 
Thank you. There were uh, tremendous underground systems throughout the ghetto to get people in and out, but there were uh, uprisings, military uprisings in many, many, many places. This is not the forum to, to go into detail, nor am I the expert on it, but there were armed rebellions in many, many places. Uh, so the answer is yes, Jews fought where they could. But um, let me just say that uh, uh, Poles, Poles fought too. There, in 1943, there was the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. In 1944, there was the Warsaw Uprising. A million Poles, I believe, died during the war. Uh, so there was a lot of resistance, partisans, of course, throughout Europe. There was a lot of resistance, uh, but the Germans were really, really powerful. <laughs> um, uh, and there was an interesting uh, discussion, Ringo Bloom talks about in his diary, that before the uprising, before the Great Deportation, the, the Jewish youth movements in the ghetto wanted to organize resistance, armed resistance then. I mean, the idea was, and maybe they were right, that if the Jews just ran for the exits and climbed over the walls, you know, hundreds, you know, thousands and thousands of people would die, but of course not as many would have died, uh, at least then, as, as um, ultimately died in the deportations in Treblinka and other places. But the problem is, is that two things. One, that there was a tremendous amount of military might uh, that the Germans had and the Polish, uh, there were po German guards, Polish guards, uh, uh, some Ukrainians, very well armed and also on the Aryan side of Warsaw even if somebody wanted to leave uh, you know a lot of Poles were turning in their Jewish neighbors they, they'd recognize somebody from before and they'd turn them into the Gestapo uh, for, for money so it was very hard to survive on the Aryan side which is not the same thing as resistance but it is escape um, yes there was a great deal of, of resistance but uh, you know, uh, when the elephant is coming uh, even if the ants put up their fists it, That's that's an interesting way of, of putting it, but um, but yes, you know, um, so there's a couple other questions, but uh, a few other questions. Somebody asked, and I don't know if you came across this in your research, but were there any uh, Germans that uh, that helped uh, the Jews in the ghetto, or or looked the other way, or uh, sure. anything? Uh, of, I, think, uh, I, I, or... I think that there were individual acts of kindness, of course. Um, and that's one of the things that is great about the Onik Shabbos archive. Um, there are records of a, of a German kindness, you know, a Nazi being an SS or a Nazi uh, soldier or guard doing a kindness, looking the other way, whatever. And there are also um, instances of a one Jew betraying another, even within the same family, you know, out of desperation for food uh, or something else. So it's not, you know, it's not, everything's not so black and white. So we do have a few more minutes for a couple more questions. Uh, somebody asked what happened to, uh, to Rachel Auerbach, uh, if you can answer that, and also um, about how many people were also involved in this whole enterprise. And um, when you were making the film, was, is anybody still alive or their descendants, did they contact you? Um. Uh, there were only three survivors of the Onik Shabbos archive. Those were directly involved. Uh, Rachel Auerbach, Hirsch Wasser, and, and Buma Wasser. They left for Israel. Uh, Rachel, as I mentioned before, she started the Survivor Testimony Department at Yad Vashem. She also wrote many, many books and articles. In particular, she was focused on writing about the uh, Jewish intellectuals and artists of the Warsaw Ghetto and about the Onik Shabbos. Uh, and what was the other question? About how many people were involved in the whole, uh, the whole 60, enterprise? About 60 directly, but then they were collecting from a lot more. All right, just one second. There was one question about the Polish, uh, the Jewish community in Poland today. Oh, yes. There is a Jewish community in Poland today. Um, many, some of the actors in the film uh, were Jewish actors from uh, Yiddish theater in Poland. Uh, the young girl in the film who plays uh, Abraham Lewin's daughter, uh, actually mm -hmm. her grandmother was in the ghetto. Um, there's a, thanks to the Tab Foundation, there's a JCC in Warsaw. There's a, of course the Poland Museum is tremendous. Um, there's, uh, Jewish cultural uh, 
festival in Krakow in the summer. Um, there's Jewish life. I mean, nothing, nothing even remotely like what was there before, but efforts. Roberta, are you at liberty to let us know what film you might be working on now? Uh, yeah, well, I'm working on a couple of things. I'm working on a, a film for the Claims Conference about the Luxembourg Agreements, which I won't go into detail what that is, but for those of you who know what it is, reparations. Which, which agreement? I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Claims Conference. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, and I'm working on, uh, I'm developing a film about, about Abraham Joshua Heschel, a documentary. Uh -huh. and I'm starting a film fund for Jewish films, for films on Jewish themes. Wonderful. So, well, you, Danny, how are we doing on questions? I, I think we're doing okay. Um, you know, there's lots of questions, I think, from probably the students about, uh, you know, from other Jews from other communities, did they uh, come into the ghetto? Um, and, you know, a lot of concern about how they survived or, or afterwards. You mentioned those from the Onik Shabbos that, that, did, uh, that did survive and they were involved in effort. Can you talk a little bit more about how the two milk cans were, were found and what efforts were made to preserve and, and use this material? Like how was all this material used? In, uh, in well, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, the first cache was found in 46 and uh, uh, Rachel Auerbach and Hirsch Wasser were the driving forces behind looking for it. Um, they just would not, especially Rachel, would not give up until uh, that they dug for those, those for that first cache, and they knew where it was because Vosser, uh, only he, Ringo Bloom, and one other person in the archive knew where everything was buried, and Vosser was one of them. And it was quite remarkable because he he barely survived. He uh, jumped off a train bound for Treblinka and survived the jump, came back to the ghetto. He also uh, survived a uh, basically a fight out in a hiding place on the Aryan side. He and his wife, wife Bloomer were the only ones who survived. And if he hadn't uh, lived, I mean, we might not have that first cache. The first cache found in 46 was three metal boxes. The second cache was found uh, in 1950, uh, actually right after Vosser and, and, uh, and Bloomer and Rachel Arba. There was Polish uh, construction crew working on the side of the former ghetto building new apartment buildings and they hit the milk cans and brought them up. And luckily uh, the foreman who was there knew what it was. He had, it was a non-Jewish Pole who had a girlfriend in the ghetto and they had been involved in some smuggling in and out and he took the milk cans to the Jewish Historical Institute and uh, they've been there ever since. The material there has been there ever since. You know, and, and you know, Miriam, I think we would be remiss if we didn't ask this one last question because I noticed a couple people in the chat asked it, but the third milk can, um, are there still any efforts to try and locate it? Where do they think it is? Or has it just been lost to history? No. Uh, well, uh, we are very certain about where it is, which is where it was buried. Well, uh, because of Vosser's notes, um, that it was buried under what is now the Chinese embassy in Warsaw. Uh, and that was where the many members of the Onik Shabbos worked after the great deportation in a brush workshop. Uh, Sam Kassow thinks there are many possibilities. It could have, the, the, arc, the cache could have been destroyed then. It was heavy bombing of the ghetto, obviously. Bomb to oblivion could have been destroyed then. Um, or it could have been uh, found by those, uh, there was a great deal of um, treasure hunting after the war, during the war, at the end of the war. Everywhere there were Jews, there were uh, both out of the truth that those who had jewels or money did bury them in the hopes of coming back uh, from deportation and finding that they're some of their wealth so they could start new lives. And also it's an anti-Semitic trip, of course, that all Jews were wealthy and had gold and jewels to bury. So everywhere there had been a Jewish camp or ghetto or whatever, homes, whatever, that there were, there were Poles looking for Jewish treasure. And it's possible that the, the third cache was found and just discarded out of disappointment that it was papers and not valuables. Um, I wanted to add that uh, the question you had asked, Annie, about how are some of the documents used, 
I first became very aware of them by teaching them through our Melton program here in Miami, actually. Uh, the Melton, I'm sure you know about the Melton Adult Learning. They have uh, programs all over the country and the Greater Miami Jewish Federation here, SAGE, uh, sponsors it. And the curriculum of Melton was written at Yad Vashem and there's a whole chapter in there on the Onik Shabbat group. And I remember when I got to that chapter and started preparing my lessons, I thought, wow, this is an incredibly interesting lesson. So um, the, the all, lesson- uh, Ringo Blum is one of the voices of the guides in the Poland Museum. Really? Yeah, so that, and my daughter just texted me that a lot of people are asking um, about survivors from the Warsaw Ghetto where there were 400,000 Jews. Um, I know that I was trained by the leaders, Ben and Balatka, who are no longer living, but I wonder how many survivors there are out there specifically from the Warsaw Ghetto that were teenagers at that time. It would be interesting to know. I don't know. Um, there weren't that many survivors of the Warsaw Ghetto. As we know, there were uh, about 50,000 people left in the ghetto of the Great Deportation. Of course, some people had escaped before then. Um, some of the, as you know, some of the ghetto fighters escaped through their tunnel systems. Right. Uh, I, I, I don't have that statistic. And one of the excellent books that really describes the whole experience is Mila 18, in case people want to read about the Warsaw Ghetto specifically, not just the Onik Shabbat. But I think this has just been one of the most fascinating discussions I've had, Roberta. And uh, unless Danny has some final messages or questions, I personally, again, want to thank you so much That's for right. this conversation. And I can't wait to see you meet you again at the popcorn stand at the next Miami Jewish Film Festival when we bring in your next film. Thank you. Thanks very much. God willing. Thank you very much. And thank everybody out there for attending this amazing program today. Thank you, Danny. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for, uh, for joining us today.